United States commitment to the alliance, U.S. Army's commitment to U.S. European command, what we call strong Europe, the Army contribution is okay as long as the Army is able to provide the rotational capability that's associated with the regionally aligned force. So with what we have here, forward stationed, and then rotational capability that'll come over, division headquarters, aviation, uh, armor brigade, then I'm satisfied that we can meet all of our requirements. But it seems that with the drawdown and the downsizing and such a loss of manpower, your mission demands have expanded. That's actually quite true, um, but that's, that's also true for the entire Army. Uh, right now, 10 division headquarters in the Army, nine of those 10 are committed somewhere. So even as the Army has begun withdrawing, uh, in the post-ISAF world, I, I don't think I remember any time where nine division headquarters were committed somewhere. I have been uh, amazed with how much U.S. Army Europe is involved in. Priority support to U.S. European Command, we're the Army component, but I had no idea how much U.S. Army Europe does for AFRICOM, for example, logistically, intelligence, signal, even aviation, uh, engineers. Uh, and then, of course, we support the AFRICOM headquarters in Stuttgart with communications and uh, infrastructure. We do a lot for Central Command. Uh, we are essential to the air and ballistic missile defense. Great Army medical system, not just Lionsdale Hospital, but the medical commands support AFRICOM, CENTCOM, as well as UCOM. It is a lot. We don't have depth in places like we used to, so there's one medical brigade, one signal brigade, one uh, sustainment brigade, uh, so not a lot of depth. Now, some of our clearances that are required, you have I'm very happy with the quality the of the leaders that we have, and I think uh, you know, that's why the Army has focused on leader development, because we're never gonna have enough resources anywhere to do what we have to do. So as long as we can continue to grow our own good leaders and get quality people into Europe, I think we'll still be able to meet our requirements. But it is worth noting that a year ago, nobody knew Russia was going to, that President Putin was going to illegally annex Crimea. There was no Ebola outbreak, and ISIL was not on the scene yet. Obviously, there were uh, extremists out there, but nothing on the scale of ISIL. So three of the biggest things that have dominated the news and have required military capability were not even on the screen just a year ago. So that's why I worry about the depth. Also, frankly, um, uh, decision makers, policy makers uh, don't immediately see why it's important to have forward station forces in Europe. If you had your wish, given all that's on your plate, would you want more forward station soldiers? For sure. I would take as many engineers as the Army could ever provide uh, because engineers do so many different tasks. I'm an infantry soldier. Uh, but I love having engineers. Now that I'm a, I'm a much older person, I realize the benefit of logistics. Nobody does big logistics like the United States Army, so the alliance depends on U.S. Army logistics. Uh, the proposed uh, Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, VJTF, that came out of uh, the Wales Summit, uh, I think U.S. contribution to that will very likely include logistics. Um, our logisticians were the first Army response to dealing with Ebola. Certainly, U.S. Army Patriot systems are completely stretched. I would welcome more depth there, but that, that's, that's my concern is the, that we don't have the depth that I think we need to, uh, but that's true of the entire Army. The threats that you prepare for in, in Europe, safe to say it is Russia, it is ISIL, uh, it is another health uh, contingency that could pop up, Syria. What U.S. Army Europe has been doing this past year, uh, for example, in Operation Atlantic Resolve, uh, that operation under U.S. European Command was initiated to assure our allies. We, everybody saw those great paratroopers from, from Vicenza arriving in the three Baltic countries in Poland, followed by the arrival of a heavy brigade combat team from the 1st Cavalry Division. That was all about assurance to our allies and deterring Russia from threatening our allies. ISIL uh, certainly uh, is a threat because so many of the terrorists, the extremists who have joined their ranks come from countries that are in Europe. All of the countries here where U.S. Army Europe operates, they are concerned, of course, about extremists 
going to Syria or Iraq, joining the fight there, getting experience, and then coming back home and inspiring or creating their own, uh, opening up their own attacks in, uh, in these European countries. Plus, they also worry about um, the so-called lone wolf who, on his own or her own, uh, decides to attack a target inside one of these countries. I think that threat is going to uh, is going to be out there for a long time. The recent terrorism attack in Paris. What's the impact to you? First thing we did, of course, was get accountability of all of our men and women uh, families who may have been on a tour in Paris or elsewhere in France. Um, second thing we've done is make sure that our procedures at all of our installations are straight. Uh, we do have uh, installations that are throughout Europe, um, but most soldiers and families live on the economy. Just as we've done for years, maintaining the right kind of profile, low profile, being smart about what you do, paying attention, uh, that sort of thing. You can't stop a determined attacker, especially somebody that's willing to blow themselves up or to, to die in the, in the process of an attack but you can do a lot of things to reduce your own vulnerability. I would also say I'm very happy with the cooperation with our host nation authorities, Germany as well as other countries, cooperation with police, uh, government agencies. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. That's an important part of this process. Is Russia considered to be one of the most likely threats that you would face here in Europe? What Russia is doing right now uh, with their illegal annexation of Crimea, the obvious support that they're given to uh, pro-separatist rebels in uh, eastern Ukraine, the so-called frozen conflicts in uh, Transnistria and, and Georgia, the uh, increased activity that they've shown buzzing U.S. Navy ships, that sort of activity is worrisome because I think it's destabilizing. The way that the alliance coming out of the Whale Summit the way the EU has stuck together with the sanctions shows that all of the countries of Europe, along with the US and Canada, um, believe that this is unacceptable behavior to, you know, to annex a part of a country. Uh, you know, NATO, the most successful alliance in the history of the world, is based on uh, Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. An attack on one is an attack on all. So that's the core principle of NATO, collective security. I am sure that Russia's number one objective is to fracture our great alliance, to, to peel off countries, to put doubt in the minds of some countries. I'm also sure that Russia believes they probably have seven or eight weeks uh, to do something before the alliance process could fully complete and, and come to a decision to act as an alliance. So what U.S. Army Europe does uh, on behalf of the Army in support of UCOM is give the president options to assure allies, deter Russia. Exactly what happened all this past year, resulting in uh, Operation Atlantic Resolve. You can only do that with forged station forces that have relationships and long-standing exercises with our allies. If I'm understanding what you're saying, USRAR serves the NATO purpose by being a presence. For sure. We represent U.S. commitment to the alliance. Just like U.S. Air Force Europe and U.S. Navy Europe and Marine Forces Europe, we represent U.S. commitment to the alliance. I mean, U.S. Army Europe, 30,000 soldiers, probably about 67,000 total, all services forward stationed in Europe. And then the Army's contribution actually is above that because of the rotational force capability that comes over and other exercises that will attract other units. In Lithuania, uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a magazine. On the front of that magazine, the, the caption read, Lithuania's Man of the Year, the NATO soldier, and there was a picture of a U.S. Army Staff Sergeant from the 173rd Airborne Brigade. That, that was the impact of one company of paratroopers from Vicenza, Italy, arriving in Lithuania to assure uh, our allies that the U.S. was there. I'm curious, you're coming into this job after having served in a NATO position. How does that experience factor into what you're shaping here? As the commander of Allied Land Command, um, I've worked with all the countries of the Alliance plus uh, PFP, Partnership for Peace Countries, and that was where I realized the importance of being specific about interoperability, communications, NATO standards, and, and so on. And so then when I transitioned to commander of U.S. Army Europe, 
I have the privilege of working with all the same countries, all the same leaders, but now I can help make sure that U.S. Army Europe is also using NATO standards, that U.S. Army Europe is prepared to operate inside uh, alliance formations, if you will, multinational formations. And I also now I have resources. I have, I can give units to exercises. I have facilities that can contribute. So uh, our three enduring priorities at uh, U.S. Army Europe, developing leaders, readiness, and enabling the alliance. So my manning priorities, for example, are filling all U.S. Army positions in any NATO headquarters. I think if I had not worked at LANCOM before this, that would have never even occurred to me. Now it's my priority for manning because that's how the U.S. helps enable the alliance, but it's also how we increase the number of men and women who get experience in Europe and understand the alliance. You have your senior leaders gathered here. Why? I think it's very important in an organization like U.S. Army Europe something this size that's uh, distributed over several countries to come together occasionally, building the teams, talking about priorities, explaining my expectations. We put a lot of responsibility in a lot of young commanders, the garrison commanders, the, the aviation brigade, the logisticians, the medical brigade, the commander of the hospital, and so on. And so get together about once a quarter and, and talk about, you know, how can the headquarters help you, the commander, be successful? How can we enable them to do all that we ask them to do? But also, I have a responsibility for their development, too. I mean, leader development is not just about lieutenants and, and young sergeants. It's about officers and civilian leaders and NCOs all the way up. So that's why we're doing this. I'm coming from across the pond in the States. When we look at you, sir, these days, most of us look upon a uh, much smaller command than what it used to be. What would be the message that you would send to those folks back in the States? U.S. Army in Europe, strong Europe, uh, is the framework that represents the contribution on behalf of the Army to NATO, uh, to U.S. European Command, to AFRICOM, and CENTCOM. Its relationships, its capabilities, it is what enables early entry instead of having to do a forcible entry. That's what Strong Europe is all about. And I would also say that U.S. Army Europe, Strong Europe, is the best leadership lab for the Army. The Army's priority is building adaptive leaders. There's no better place to do that than in U.S. Europe. We are living the Army operating concept. That's what U.S. Europe is.